All right, awesome. How are you guys? How many people from the city of New York at Albany? Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> Where are you guys from? Which school? Hey. Which one? Indian River. Where is Indian River? I did an interview last year. We're going to do one again. Where else? Indian River, where else? UCF. UCF is the only traveling finance club in the world, just so you know. Somehow I'm walking down a hall in a Las Vegas casino and a couple 20 UCF finance club members. It's awfully scary. We got UCF, Indian River, where else? Bernardina Beach. Bernardina Beach. <laughs> All right. So anyway, I think this is an incredible event because, um, because get I worked my butt off to get a, a lot of people in a room just to hear about finance and and truthfully our demographic is about you know the, the average demographic of the day, which is at least you know 100,000 people a day, is a 55-year-old white male. That's essentially our demographic. So when I see this room, I'm like, wow, this is so cool because, you know, you guys are, you're the next generation carrying the torch in finance. And finance is really cool, but it doesn't have a great reputation. So I decided to do something a little different today, and I hope you like it. It's a pretty fast-paced presentation. I'm going to show you 10 strategies or 10 traits. I don't know, I'm not sure best how best to classify them. 10 things you need to know, and I assume everybody is from, I assume we have everything from freshmen to graduate students. So my purpose in this, 10 slides, three to four minutes per slide, talking about a specific area of knowledge that will help you get to the next level in finance. You know, when, when we interview people and when we talk to people inside the industry, we look at how how strong are you at articulating finance? How strong are you at articulating math? How strong are you at explaining strategies? How strong is the depth of your understanding? And let me tell you something. You have an opportunity, every one of you, to change what has long been a legacy of lack of know-how and lack of expertise and mostly just about asset gathering. You have an opportunity to change an entire industry and make it about strategy and make it about logic, and make it all kind of make sense to people because you'll be able to explain it. So what's so neat about this discussion is I'm going to go through, I think, the 10 things that I'd want you to know if you were coming to our firm as a, you know, as a, let's say, somebody that just graduated, either undergrad or grad school, and was looking for a position, and you were interested in one of our research positions, one of our dev positions, one of our trade, pos trade desk positions, or whatever else it was, the things that I want to hear from somebody is an understanding of the following 10 pieces. So I'll take you through this, and we'll do it quickly. 10 things to know to succeed in finance. Ready? Let's do it. So first. And I'm going to take it again. The foundation of all derivative strategies is understanding options. Why? Because options are a great area. They're a great area product, which means they're strategic in nature. You can be wrong using option strategies and still make money, and you can be right using option strategies and lose money. To me, anything that is not black and white, anything that is gray is fascinating. And without an clear understanding of derivative strategies, which is not taught in very many places through academia other than very basic textbook stuff. It's important to know the number one concern we have when interviewing somebody is, a la is that they really have a depth of understanding. I don't care if you can recite Black-Scholes or you can explain the math model behind the Greeks. What I care about is that you understand specific derivative strategies that focus on the application of a strategic 
mathematical, quantitative approach to investing. So the single most important piece is, and I know this sounds kind of like, well, I don't have enough capital to trade options. I don't have enough, I don't really have enough opportunity to do different things in the derivative space. Whether it's listed options, whether it's over-the-counter options, whether it's commodity options or whatever else it is, an understanding of basic option strategies, which means buying stuff, spreading stuff, and selling stuff is critical to next level success. So the second piece, number two, is understanding the futures markets. Because remember, markets go to liquidity and markets go to leverage. And the single most liquid leverage marketplace is the futures marketplace. So understanding that futures and futures options have a, are highly correlated to individual equities and they also have this characteristic we call product indifference, which means one S&P future is the same as 500 shares of spiders, which is the same as um, 10 at the money options or five in the money options. Understanding that they're all the same product gets you immediately, when you're having a discussion with somebody talking about finance, you're like, I'm product indifferent. I couldn't care less which product we use. We'll use the product that's most liquid, that gives us the most choices strategically that best fits what we call efficient use of capital. Efficient use of capital is, why would I buy 500 shares of spiders and put up $70,000 when I can buy one S&P future and put up $5,500 and they're the exact same position? Or buy 10 options and put up $2,500 and they're all the exact same position. They're theoretically equivalent. So understanding the relationship and having this real acceptance of product indifference when it comes to finance puts you at a completely different level. When you talk to a finance professor, when you talk to an interviewer, when you talk to somebody that, that you, if you want to go to the next level, whether it's banking, whether it's financial services, or whether it's in the professional side of the business, it could be a hedge fund, a prop firm, or whatever else. Once you get in the business, you have to be able to articulate the difference between products and how it doesn't matter to you because very few professionals can really explain that. So the next piece is understanding the relationship between different products and the pairs relationship, which means understanding data, understanding divergence, and understanding correlation. It's really important. Sorry, Jeff, you were saying something. Have a clear picture of what does correlation mean and how does beta work. And in today's technology, you just log on to any platform and you can essentially see what your beta weighting is to the S&P 500, which just means how correlated are you to the S&P 500. And if you have two different underlyings on, like for example, most industry professionals think if you're, if you're long emerging markets and you're long US stocks, you are diversified. But the reality is, if you're long US stocks and you're long emerging markets and they have a correlation of let's say 75, you're not that, you're not that diversified. But if you're long US stocks and you're long gold, which has a correlation of basically zero, then all of a sudden you're diversified. So understanding and being able to explain what correlation, what correlation is and what, and what divergent, what, what, what essentially what divergent markets mean and where that opportunity is. What's a pairs trade? A pairs trade is buying something and selling something else that is highly correlated, but that correlation has gone out to price extreme. So for example, recently, on the last run up in the stock market, the, S&P, um, the S&Ps and the NASDAQ and the Dow exploded up here and the Russell didn't move at all. So that relationship between the Russell 2000 and the, and the Dow, let's just say for example, exploded up to the widest it's ever been. Recently, that's come back down and that's a nice correlated pair that got to a price extreme, got way out of whack, and just came back into line. The same thing, you can, you can use the same thing for you know, gold and silver, you can use the same thing for 10-year 10 10 notes and 30-year bonds. But understanding how beta works, and I'm assuming that most people understand beta and correlation because they're very close to each other, and understanding divergence between correlated products, that's where opportunity is. You know, opportunity is not saying, hey, if you came in and said, do a lot of research, really understand the markets and I'm really excited about gold because I think it's going higher, we couldn't care less. If you came in and said, you know what, I've been studying, I've been studying IBM and I'm really convinced this stock, is on, this stock is on a low and I love this company, we couldn't care less. But if you said to me that the correlation between IBM and Microsoft is 73 and that, 
the divergence between prices at the widest level it's been at in 25 years, all of a sudden, I'm interested. If you said to me that, that I watch bonds and I watch notes, which is essentially the yield curve, and that's flattened to a level that we haven't seen in you know, 45 years, all of a sudden, I'm interested. But if you told me you're bullish on bonds or bearish on notes, I couldn't care less. Hopefully, that makes sense because I care about your ability, to, your ability to articulate divergence and opportunity. I don't care about what you think about the markets. Nobody does. So that's neat. Next thing is a specific opportunity, like the yield curve, which I just mentioned. So not too many 20-year-olds or 21-year-olds get an opportunity to understand and trade something like the yield curve. But if you knew you could trade it for maybe a few hundred dollars or even less than that, Maybe it's interesting. The yield curve is the relationship between long-term rates and short-term rates. And recently, that relationship got down to a level that we have never seen before, meaning that yield curve had narrowed and had flattened to a level where it was trading, let's just say, if I could throw a number on it, about 35 basis points. Well, if you believe it won't go inverted, which is fair to assume, then there's 35 basis points of risk to the downside, and the norm for that relationship is about 125 basis points. So if you could articulate that, hey, and this is what I want to hear from young people, and I, I hear it sometimes. And when we hear it, we get all excited because we're like, oh my God, this is a different level of understanding. But if you can articulate that, hey, something's trading at 35 basis points, it's got a floor at around zero, and it averages 125, well, the first thing that goes through my head is, those are amazing pot odds. And pot odds are essentially what we're playing for, because we don't know what's going to happen. So what are pot odds? Pot odds are when you have 35 ticks in risk and 70 ticks in potential profit just because it's a math equation, not because you think it's going to happen. And that's the fascinating thing. And again, what I'm trying to prep you for, and I only have 45 minutes for this, is being able to articulate like why you would do something. What I love is when somebody can explain to me, I'm doing this because I believe it's a 50-50 shot, but I can make two and a half and lose one. That's all you need to hear. Because then you're saying, wow, this, I like the way this person's thinking. I like the way they're working through you know, the pot odds or the math on this. The yield curve's interesting because everybody understands interest rates. And bonds are, you know, whatever, a $30, $40 trillion space in the listed marketplace. You can trade them down to derivative. You can use derivatives all the way up to, you can use options, you can use ETFs, you can use futures, and you can trade them for, with very small amounts of money. And one of the best things to learn especially if you just have a, you know, a small amount of money and you're starting to learn how to trade, one of the best things to trade that has the lowest implied volatility, has lower implied volatility relative to stocks, but it still moves around a lot, is the yield curve. So it's just a suggestion. If you're looking for something to try, we have a yield curve that's very flat over the last years and years and years of easing, and it's something you might want to consider. But at the very least, you should be able to explain it because once you can explain the opportunities in interest rates, you can easily explain the opportunities in bonds and other commodities, and it all just kind of snowballs from there. So, which takes me to a little bit more of a complex topic, but you need to understand vol arb and vol dispersion arb, which same thing, but you need to understand the relationship between volatility, which is expected move, and finance. Because essentially, I'm sure you've read this past week that, and I talked a little about this last night if you came to my last night, but over the last week, you've seen a bunch of um, inverse volatility funds kind of blow up. But that takes, that kind of puts a, that kind of puts volatility in a bad light. But volatility is very simply just expected move. And if you can explain expected move, and you can find opportunities inside of volatility, because volatility is essentially a measure of opportunity, it's just a fear gauge. And one of the neatest things for finance students anywhere is being able to explain VOLARB because every professional loves the concept of VOLARB because it makes sense. XYZ is trading with a 30% volatility. ABC is trading with a 20% volatility. They have a correlation of 80. So I'll sell the 30, buy the 20, and then I'm highly correlated, so if the markets move in natural, random fashion, there should be an opportunity to make money in there when volatility normalizes. Because remember, volatility is mean reverting. So the neat thing about VOLARB is if you have a mean reverting asset and it's stretched to a point of some kind of 
divergence, then all of a sudden you look at it and you go, wow, this is a really interesting story. I don't know if it's going to work, but it's an interesting story. I can sell this, buy this. They are highly correlated. And maybe if they go back to their means, we profit from that. Now, again, what's neat about this is you have to be able to explain it. And once you can explain it, you're at a different level in finance. Almost every quant fund, almost every prop firm, almost every hedge fund deals specifically with Vol Arp. And as soon as you understand, essentially, eventually, as an individual investor, I trade volatility. That's all I do. And most people that are individual investors that are successful essentially trade volatility as, as self-directed investors. But it requires just a little bit of capital. And when you're learning, just understanding the basic principles behind Volarb, very important in ex explaining kind of you know, why you're excited about this industry. Next thing is hedging. And hedging is something that we don't necessarily cover in a classic fashion. So hedging is something like, let's say you own a stock, XYZ, it's trading for 100, and you want to hedge it. My question would be, why? Like, why would somebody hedge a stock? Because you're worried about it going down, right, if you're long it, and if you're worried about it going up if you're short it. So that's probably why you would hedge a stock, but then why wouldn't you just sell it? And so the argument for hedging individual stocks to me is pretty weak because if you own a stock and you think it's going down, just sell it and forget about the tax consequences for now. And if you're short a stock and you think it's going up, then just cover it because hedging it is too expensive. Why is hedging expensive? Because the implied volatility numbers or the expected move is greater than the realized move. So when you hedge something, you pay a number, it's essentially insurance, and you pay a number that's statistically beneficial to the seller, not to you. So then why do you have to learn about hedging? You have to learn about hedging because it's not about hedging individual stocks. The key to hedging, if somebody asks you the question or when you go to talk about hedging in an interview or you go to talk about it when you're writing a research paper or you're doing it for a school project, the neat thing about hedging is understanding that, hey, I have six different positions on or you have 30 different positions on or this fund has 100 different positions on or this bank has 1,000 different positions on. How do you hedge that portfolio? How do you neutralize that portfolio using, using the concepts of product indifference to get you to a point where you can say, hey, we're going home flat tonight, or we're going home without that much risk on? Very few people understand risk, and very few young people understand market risk because everything to you has always been black and white. There's very few opportunities to make hedging decisions in your life. But when you think about it, and you can ex articulate and explain hedging, all of a sudden it gets really interesting. So you buy five different underlyings. There's virtually, there's some correlation, either positive or negative, between all five or 10 different underlyings that you buy. And with one simple trade, you can offset all that risk. For example, your net delta, your net directional risk comes out to two or 300 shares of spiders when it's all beta weighted to a specific underlying. And the next thing you know, you sell 300 shares of spiders and you're flat. That's called kind of, that's theoretical delta neutrality. But the neat thing about this is, you're all smart. You wouldn't be here on a you know, Friday afternoon if this wasn't something you're really into and you weren't passionate about it. So the neat thing is, understanding hedging outside of, hey, I'm selling this against a specific stock, I'm buying a put against this specific stock or index, or I'm selling you know, this option against a specific stock or index, that's not hedging. You can sell those out, you can close out those positions, you can do whatever. Being able to explain that the cost of expected move versus realized move is too great to make hedging an efficient pro process on individual underlyings. But if you want to hedge an entire portfolio, that makes sense. So imagine this. Imagine I took five different stocks, and in each of those five different stocks, I used some kind of option strategy or future strategy or vol dispersion strategy, some of those first three things I talked about. And then when that was all said or done, when that was all those positions were put on at that point, the next thing I said is, make me flat. So the game plan is collect all the premium from the volatility reverting to the mean, because that's a math model, and then hedge the position theoretically by using a static underlying like stock or futures. Once you can explain that, you can work for anybody. And I know you're looking at me like, I think he may be crazy, and it's possible. He may be, but we have put so 
We have put so many young people in positions of managing huge amounts of money and really taking on a lot of responsibility throughout the world of finance just because they can explain these 10 topics that I'm showing you today that nobody else ever talks about and in a different way. And I know you're listening to saying, I'm not so sure that's true, but it is. It is. You know, we've seen people go from like just first time interviews to basically being portfolio managers because they understand that there's way more to this business than, than they've ever kind of imagined with respect to hedging, with respect to product understanding, with respect to a strategic understanding. So let's talk about the importance of fear and how opportunity is priced because volatility, which you see exploding right now, we, we, in two short weeks, we have blown up the entire short volatility bubble. I'm not sure how closely you have, you have an opportunity to watch all this, but I'm assuming most of you have been aware for the last 15 or 16 months, the market has traded in the lowest volatility, at the lowest volatility levels, both on an average mode and mean, that it has in the entire history of the stock market. So we got down to levels over the last 15 months that we have never seen in the history of the stock market, which meant complacency was at record highs, which meant more importantly, that opportunity, non-directional opportunity, was at record lows. Non-directional opportunity means that unless you were bullish, unless you played the market to the upside, opportunity was at record lows, because there's no fear in the market. All of a sudden, in two weeks, you've seen volatility go a little bit greater than double, in some cases, triple in the broad market. That's an extraordinary move, but it probably broke the volatility bubble that we've seen, the short volatility bubble that we've seen for the last couple of years. The good part, and the reason for this is, number one, breaking of the volatility bubble means there's going to be huge opportunity, and you guys are, your timing's perfect. You happen to be born the right year. Number two is because of that, because you're going to see extended opportunity over the next couple of years now, because since volatility is mean reverting, it means that for the next few years, maybe even the next decade, you're going to see increased movement in all markets. When you see increased movement in all markets, you see an increase in trading activity. When you see an increase in trading activity, you see an increase in job opportunities. And all of a sudden, the employment space in the financial side, when markets get volatile, explodes. I know that's kind of a backward down, trickle down approach to it, but when the business is boring and flat, and there's nothing happening and there's no opportunity, there's very few jobs. As soon as opportunity starts to happen, as soon as volatility starts to explode, all of a sudden, everybody gets more active because all of a sudden, we realize that you know, bull markets make people into geniuses that aren't geniuses. And bear markets and explosions in volatility, I'm not saying bear market, I'm just where we've seen an explosion in volatility recently. An explosion in volatility gives people that are smart, logical, that can use common sense, an opportunity to shine. So the takeaway from this is if you, you recognize what's going on right now, you'll see that there's a ton more opportunity and there'll be a ton more opportunity going forward than we've had for the last five years. So if you're about to get out of school or whatever, you know, or this is something you plan to pursue, the opportunities ahead of you now will probably be pretty good for the next decade. And your ability to explain all this stuff will be very supportive as to your foundation, you know, of, of. So, digital strategies, because I promised I'd touch on this. So, let's talk digital for just a second. So, digital is your world. I know they say, I mean, it's my world too, because I trade digital. But digital essentially is your world. It's a millennial world, at least at this point. Opened at various you know, firms all over the world. The problem with digital strategies are, is, there are none. The wonderful world of digital currencies, Bitcoin and everything else included, is there's no depth to the market, there's no listed liquidity that's worth anything, and there's no strategies. So as much as I love the digital, as much as I love the space because I think it has the potential, and I say potential because it's interesting, but it's all potential still because right now it's a speculative asset bubble and whether it becomes something later on, we don't know. But the reason I think it's important to understand this, 
Again, because it's a piece of your ability to articulate the space. The problem in the digital marketplace right now, which includes 2,200 different currencies, which includes you know, the ICO market, which includes everything else, is that it's very black and white. Either you buy them and you hope it goes up, or you sell them short, which is really hard to do, and you hope it goes down. There's a lack of liquidity. There's a lack of, 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 there's a lack of, of listed marketplace trading, and there's a lack of transparency among the firms making markets. That always becomes hard to scale, but eventually they'll take, you know, they'll hit the, um, they'll hit the listed marketplace. What you need to understand in the digital world is what it is, how it works, and where the opportunity is. So if some 21-year-old comes in or 22-year-old comes in and says to me, hey, you know what? I'm a digital currency expert. My first question would be, what does that mean? You're a digital currency expert. Because I'm a digital currency expert, I would say. Because I think XYZ is going higher. Does that make me an expert? And they'll be like, no, 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 no. Here's why I'm an expert, and I want to hear. And if you can say to me, I'm an expert because I am preparing myself for when there are derivative strategies available or for different arbitrage opportunities between markets or because you can explain the correlation between different products and you can explain the divergences between different correlations and you can figure out by backing in, looking at the numbers, what the implied volatility is of these currencies, then all of a sudden I'm interested. But if you tell me you're an expert because you understand how they work and you understand and you're bullish or bearish for whatever fundamental reasons you have, I couldn't care less. So to me, the digital space is fascinating, it's wide open, but for reasons that most people, I've never heard them explain. There is no trade. There's just buy them, hold them, hope it goes higher, or sell them, and hope it goes lower, but it's really hard to short the marketplace. So for me, the digital marketplace is really interesting, but I need to see more. I need to see a derivative space to it. I need to see an opportunity where there's some transparency in the marketplace. I need to see much bigger money go in after it so that it becomes real. Anyway, it's important to be able to at least talk about that. So lastly, getting into selling premium. So this is really important to me because, and we'll go back to digital for just one second, and I talked briefly about this last night, so sorry for repeating it. In the premium marketplace, premium is determined by implied volatility. Implied volatility in the digital marketplace, Bitcoin and others, averaged about 130% for most of 2017. It's currently a little bit lower right now, about, let's just call it 100%. But the stock market volatility is about 35% or 33%. And when you take 33% stock market volatility and you compare the liquidity and the depth of product, there's no reason to trade digital. When stock market volatility is 10 and digital volatility is 130, there's every reason in the world to trade digital currencies because you can make money doing it. When digital currency implied volatility goes down and stock market volatility goes up, nobody trades digital and that's what's happening right now. But understanding the concept of selling premium is the single most important thing that you, that you really have to understand. It's the most important thing to know and to be able to talk about because selling premium is a way of reducing basis or improving basis. Selling premium is a way to let the marketplace work for you. If implied volatility is expected move and realized volatility is lower than implied volatility, which realizes what actually happened, then why wouldn't you sell something that's higher than what's actually going to happen? And the answer is, you have to. In order to be successful, you have to. So then, why doesn't everybody? Because there's an element of undefined risk. There's an element of understanding where that risk actually lies. So what's so fascinating about this is most people do not get to experience selling any premium. That means like, you know, option premium more than anything else. Most people don't get to experience selling any premium unless they do something for themselves, unless they trade their own account, unless they open up an account and make a few trades, sell a credit spread, sell a, sell, sell a naked put, sell a naked call, whatever it is, sell a put spread, sell a call spread, sell an iron condor, sell any, I don't even care what you do, sell anything. To, so you get to see how premium decay works, especially when opportunity is at a peak like it is now, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, now I get this. Let's let the marketplace 
work for us. And that's something that's kind of hard to conceptualize and even harder to explain until you've done it, but really easy to do on your own because anybody can do it with almost any underlying. Oops. Okay, so I just want to make sure I didn't go over here for a quick second. 225, perfect. So those 10 underlyings, I mean, I'm sorry, those 10 approaches, let me go back real quickly and just go through them because I went through them really fast. I just wanted to talk. Oh, there you go. That's nine. There, there it is, right here. Is that 10? Perfect. Sorry about that. I knew there was one more. I was looking for it. Basis reduction. Let me, start, let me finish with that. So basis reduction means if you're going to buy a stock at, a, at $100, why not buy it less than that? Why not try to buy it for $97 and improve your statistical chance of success? If you're going to buy this bottle of water for a dollar, why not buy it for 90 cents if you can and give away your upside? Basis reduction means, or basis improvement. I shouldn't say reduction. I should say improvement. Basis improvement essentially is the core strategy for every single thing we do. Being able to explain basis improvement means that you understand the concept of portfolio management and you understand the concepts behind wealth creation. If this bottle of water costs a dollar and you can buy it for 90 cents, you have a statistical advantage over everybody that bought it for a dollar. It can still go to zero, theoretically. So if it goes from a dollar to zero, you lose 90 cents. Everybody else that bought it a dollar loses a dollar, so you did a little bit better, 10% better. But in most cases, markets are random. And if you can continually lower your basis by giving away some of your upside, you will outperform all of your competitors, and you will impress those who you work with or for or for yourself, and that's how you build wealth. All wealth is created. Wealth is not created through being right. Wealth is created through being smart. And to be smart, you need to reduce basis or improve basis. To improve basis means, if I bought this at a dollar, I have unlimited upside. But the reality of it is, the expected move on this, let's say the implied volatility is 30 cents. That means the expect, or 30. That means the expected move on this is from 70 to $1.30. Let me, I'll start over. This bottle costs a dollar. The implied volatility, which is how much it's gonna move, is 30. That means the expected move over the course of the next year is 70 cents to $1.30. If I want to buy this at 90, I'm going to have to limit my upside to $1.15, even though the expected move is all the way up to 130. But if I'm going to want to buy this at 90, I'm going to limit my upside to $1.15. By doing that, I buy this at 90. You buy this, somebody else that doesn't limit their upside buys this at a dollar. Statistically, although my upside is limited, statistically, my probability of success goes from 50-50 all the way up to about 65%. That's the probability of making at least one penny based on the, based on the expected move. So the next thing you know, I have a 65% probability of success. You have a 50%. You have unlimited upside, and I gave up unlimited upside in return for upside but a higher probability of success. In business, and Christy will talk about this next because that's what her discussion's about, but in business, any kind of business, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're a trader, whether you're a money manager, whatever part of the financial space you get into, if you can explain that a reduction in basis or an improvement in basis improves your probability of success, success breeds success. What we're looking for is scalable success. How can you have scalable success in random markets? If this is a random market and you don't know if it's going to be 70 cents or $1.30 in a year, it is very hard to have predictable, scalable success. If you want to apply any one of those 10 things that we talked about in finance and apply them continually, you need to have scalable, repeatable success. All of a sudden, that makes you super valuable. And just being able to explain basis improvement is the key to long-term success for any business, any business. That's my last slide. So, um, so I hope you had a chance. I'll go through them really quick. Let me see if I can go back 
backwards on this. I don't know if I can. Oh, perfect. I'll go through them just in, for one sec. So just as a really quick recap, because these are the 10 things I think you need to know to be successful in the world of finance. And this means through the interview process, through the, I, last year I talked about differentiation, through the differentiation process, through the articulation process, and through just your personal success. It doesn't matter to me if, if you're in this room and you're listening to discussion and you're in finance, but you're gonna enter the business world. Somehow you're gonna support yourself and somehow you're gonna take whatever you've learned the first 22 years of your life and take that into you know, the next 40 or 50 years of your life. It starts with a foundation. Understanding how derivative strategies work is the one place you can go to make tons of decisions, to improve your decision-making skills, which ultimately, the number of decisions you make has a direct relationship with how successful you are. Futures and optics is important to understand the futures business because the futures business drives the securities business. Most amount of leverage, most amount of liquidity. Pairs trading, understanding the relationship works and how price divergence, what that means is cool because there is no such thing as mean reversion with respect to price. It's just, it's just a, um, it's just something that's very objective. It's completely subjective. I should say that. It's completely subjective. With volatility, it's mean reverting. There's a math model behind it. With price, it's just subjective. So understanding that and looking for opportunity that way is kind of neat. Next is yield curve. Being able to articulate interest rates and the yield curve is important because when you get to a certain level, everybody cares about interest rates, and yet very few people can explain interest rates. If I ask my kids about interest rates and they're the same age, just a couple years older than you, um, they'd have a really impossible time explaining yield curve, and I've talked to them about it a hundred times. They won't listen. <laughs> yield curve is just, just a young person that can explain flattening and widening of interest rates and just how that yield curve works, to me, very impressive. Uh, Valarb, the, uh, the, the essence behind and kind of some of the essentials behind the entire professional world of finance. And just knowing that volatility and how it works and how it is expected to move and how correlation plays a role with respect to premium and volatility is a special skill, and very few kids have it. Hedging, knowing that individual stocks, individual underlyings, very difficult to hedge and probably not worth it because the expected move is greater than the realized move, which means you have to pay the price of the expected move, which means it doesn't work, or it doesn't work, it's not worth it. So hedging is a portfolio thing. Volatility, understanding essentially that volatility is a measure of fear and is a measure of expected move. And as soon as you learn how to take, take advantage of volatility, because you understand what it really is, fascinating stuff. Digital strategies, just get what it is. Understand, be able to understand, explain blockchain, be able to understand, explain various currencies, just it keeps you well-rounded, informed, it makes you sound intelligent. But remember, right now, there's no real marketplace there. I mean, I know there's lots of trading going on, and I understand that lots of small trades and everything else, but it's not scalable enough at this point, and it's not interesting enough strategically to play a role, especially with us. Selling premium, critical to understand what that is and how it works and the logic behind it and the math behind it because it is the one way to take advantage of outsized volatility. And lastly, Basis improvement, because basis improvement in the end is your key to long-term, scalable, and repeatable success.